Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicle. The series of books and videos on American history is seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of William Taft, and the focus is, he's not TR. The year is 1909. William Taft is the 27th president of the United States, and to his credit, Roosevelt, his predecessor, had cleared the field. He left on a safari to Africa. He was going to be gone for a year, give Taft some space, an opportunity to kind of get his own footing as president of the United States. And he would stumble, and he would stumble consistently in the eyes of Roosevelt's followers. The progressives who had come to expect so much from Roosevelt, they were starting at the very beginning to be disappointed in the presidency of William Taft, beginning with the tariff. Now, the tariff had been a complicated issue in American politics, really, for decades. Long long-standing debates about whether or not this principal means of funding the government, which was on this tax on imports, should be set at just enough money to fund the government or at higher levels, protective tariffs, to actually be high enough to protect domestic industries against international competition. Now, the Republicans over the last 20 years had pretty much been high tariff oriented with the likes of Benjamin Harrison, William McKinley, but even McKinley in his last speech before he was assassinated signaled a change in his philosophy on, econ on, on economics to go with more reciprocity, free trade deals to help the uh, new uh, export business of the United States. So things were a bit in flux. Roosevelt had largely stayed away from the tariff, again, because it was a complicated kind of no-win issue politically, but the Republican Party in the 08 campaign had been for reducing the tariff, and William Taft had signed on to this as part of his presidential campaign. In fact, the platform of the Republican Party called for a special session as soon as the next president was elected to focus on reducing the rates of the tariff. Well, again, Roosevelt had warned Taft about the tariff, but this was an important pledge that had been given in the campaign, and Taft was not going to back off. He called for the special session. But he did things a little bit odd in that he opened up that session with a very terse statement that didn't really take sides. It didn't advocate for lowering the tariff, which had been the theme of the campaign, pretty much had put it on to the hands of Congress. And he said at the time that I have no disposition to exert any other influence than that which it is my function under the Constitution to exercise. This was taking a small view of the presidency, very different from the bully pulpit that Theodore Roosevelt would use in terms of his advocacy. For Taft, he was going to trust the old guard Republicans that were in the Congress. Joe Cannon, who was the Speaker of the House, Senator Nelson Aldrich, who was a leader in the Senate, he was going to trust them to follow the Republican platform. And they did a little, and then they didn't. And starting in the House, they actually did follow the platform. Sarah no Payne led an effort to produce a bill that did bring down rates on many items across the board. But then it went to the Senate, and the Senate wasn't cooperating. They were pushing for increases in many tariff items. The conservatives actually wanting more protection, and Taft's campaign pledge was frankly falling apart. The bill that came to him, or that was going to come to him, had to come through a conference committee, and that's where they tried to get the House and the Senate to come to an agreement. And here Taft started to engage. He started to invite congressmen and senators to the White House for dinners, pushing more reductions. Now Taft, in the bill that eventually came to him, got a number of things that he wanted. Number one of which was free trade for the Philippines, which had been something that he had been advocating with Congress for about 10 years from the time that he had been Governor General of the Philippines. And this was a big deal to Taft. He said that it has been a long, hard fight and the possibility of great improvement arising from this feature of the present tariff bill is one of the reasons why I should be very reluctant to veto that bill. Kind of a poison pill that the congressman knew giving Taft this meant he might have to take it all. But Taft actually got other things that he liked as well. He got a tariff board that would try to take politics out of setting rates for the tariff going forward. It was only a temporary board, possibility later to become permanent. Taft liked this feature. He also liked the provision for a corporate income tax. For the first time in American history, 1% tax on businesses that had net income over $5,000 a year. Now, a lot of the progressives were pushing for a personal income tax, but Taft was against this at the time because his beloved Supreme Court had ruled that the uh, personal income tax was unconstitutional. So at the time, Taft was pushing for a constitutional amendment for the personal income tax, which he would eventually get. And in the meantime, he was happy to have the corporate uh, income tax or the corporate tax included in this tariff bill. In the end, the bill that came to him reduced rates on 654 items. 
it raised rates on 220 items. But what the progressives really didn't like was the fact that the rates that came down didn't come down enough, and over 1,000 items had no change at all. This was far short of what they expected, far short of what they thought Taft and the Republicans had promised. But when Taft got this bill, overall in balance, he supported it. August 5th, 1909, he signed it into law. Now, Will Taft was happiest a lot of times during his presidency when he got out of the bubble of Washington. Go out and meet the people, tended to get good receptions. And so as soon as the Taft bill was signed, he went and took a trip, gone for a couple of months. The key speech he gave was at the Opera House in Winona, Minnesota, where he walked through slowly by surely, here's how we got to where we got in this very difficult sausage making of a tariff bill. But in the end, Taft concluded that on the whole, therefore, I am bound to say that I think the Payne Tariff Bill is the best tariff bill that the Republican Party ever passed. The best tariff bill. That was the headline across the newspapers across the country, mostly with derision. This was not what the progressives had called for. They wanted much greater reduction. This could hardly be the best tariff bill that could come forward, and Taft was frankly lambasted for saying so. Well, then Taft ran headstrong into the conservationists, and this was going to be a problem for him as well. These are some of the most passionate progressive followers from the Legion of Roosevelt followers. They were vocal behind their leader, Gifford Pinchot. And Pinchot was the chief of the U.S. Forest Service. He was independently wealthy. He was in this for a cause, kind of a personal crusade to push for more and more conservation. And he was at odds with the new Secretary of the Interior, Richard Ballinger, almost from the beginning. Because Ballinger had reversed course on one of his predecessor's decisions, which was to put aside millions of acres of public land for conservation along the national waterways. Well, Ballinger was concerned that some of these decisions decisions were actually not founded in law. He convinced the president he had to pull these back, and Pinchot was outraged at this. How could he backtrack on such a key provision of the Roosevelt agenda? He was a being a traitor to that cause, and he took the issue straight to Taft. Well, Taft was irked by this. First of all, chain of command. Taft wanted everything to go through his cabinet secretaries, and Pinchot just violated that. And in the end, the legal analysis, Taft agreed with Ballinger. Now, there was a lot of push for him to fire Pinchot, basically being insubordinate, but Taft was really cautious about this. He said if the whole contention is the result of some sort of conspiracy, Pinchot's dismissal would only bring about what they are trying to do, an open rupture between Roosevelt and myself, and I am determined if such a rupture is ever brought about, and it shall not be through any action of mine. I'm going to give Pinchot as much rope as he wants, and I think you will find that he will hang himself. Well, he did just that. That Rooseveltian cloud was still hanging over uh, Taft's administration and Pinchot was still pushing along these lines. So what did he do? He took the next step, a public letter to Senator Jonathan and Dollinger, which basically criticized his own administration. This was in December of 1909. It was the straw that broke the back for Taft and he fired Pinchot the very next month, making him a martyr in the eyes of the, of the progressives. Pinchot, what did he do? He immediately went to Europe because Roosevelt's safari was ending. He was going to spend some time in Europe, and Pinchot was going to give him an earful to start that path to complaining from the eyes of the progressives. Well, William Taft was distraught about all of this. He took it all personally. He was edgy all of a sudden. That big smile was basically gone from him. He was quick to anger, and he thought the press was treating him unfairly, but he refused to engage. This was another area in his presidency that was so different from Roosevelt, who mastered the press to get him on his side, that frankly Taft refused to engage, refused to give stories to the press. He said, I'm going to do what I think is best for the country within my jurisdiction and power and let the rest take care of itself. I'm not looking for a second term. I'm not going to subject myself to the worry involved in establishing a publicity bureau or attempting to set myself right before the people in any different way from that which is involved in the ordinary publication of what is done. The misrepresentations which are made by the muckraking correspondence I cannot neutralize and I don't intend to. Well, he could have tried. He didn't try and he suffered the consequences. In fact, he kind of went out of his way to upset the press in a couple of areas that touched them personally, 
Back to the tariff. There had been a push to bring down the rates on print paper and wood pulp that the publishers really wanted. They came down, but not nearly as much as they had hoped for. And then Taft actually became an advocate to increase the postage on second-class mail. Second-class mail is newspapers, magazines, and other periodicals. So all of a sudden, their cost of business was going up. This just made the press more and more upset. And the common refrain from them, just like progressive followers, were he's not Roosevelt. The stress was mounting on, on, on Taft. He was eating again, which he did when he was stressed. He was gaining weight. He was topping 350 pounds now. He was still getting plenty of exercise, playing golf as an escape almost on a daily basis, but the weight kept coming. The bad moods kept coming. Archie Butt said at the time that I feel dreadfully sorry for him. He gets so low in spirits, it's impossible to cheer him. He just sits silently by and grows morose and fat and angry. This was not an easy time for William Taft personally or professionally. Now, he did get some reforms done, some positives. He added over 50,000 positions into the protected list on civil service reform. That was kind of a big deal. He also created a unified budget for the executive branch for the first time in American history. He actually paved the way for Congress to create the Bureau of the Budget. This is a pretty significant lasting reform, but frankly, no one cared. This was back office stuff. This was not the things that people cared about. What excited to the people, the return of Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt came back to a hero's welcome June 18th of 1910, 21 gun salute for the hundreds of ships that were in New York Harbor. Hundreds of thousands cheered Roosevelt as he, as he marched down Broadway. He was the hero that was coming back to the United States. And what about Will Taft? Well, he was generous. He invited Roosevelt to come to the White House and Roosevelt declined. He said he didn't think it was appropriate for a former president to come to the White House unless it were like an emergency. And so he turned down Taft and Taft was hurt by this. Now, within a couple of months, they arranged for an alternate site. The Taft started during their presidency vacationing in Beverly, Massachusetts in a cottage there right on the water. And Roosevelt's daughter, Alice, actually lived nearby. He was visiting her. This was easy. Let's meet at the presidential cottage in Beverly. They did. They got together. They got a little confusing about what to call each other who was going to be Mr. President, but they got past that and had a reasonably pleasant time telling stories, mostly of Roosevelt's journeys abroad. But this would be about the last time that they would have a positive interaction, really, for the next several years. Roosevelt went home to Oyster Bay, and the progressives just started showing up, almost a pilgrimage to their champion, and they were complaining. Taft is too conservative. He's too close to the conservative leaders in Congress. The Pinchot firing, the lack of patronage, one thing after after another that they were complaining about, but mainly what they were saying is, Will Taft is not TR. Now, Roosevelt is listening to this. His ego is building. He's getting agitated by it. So what did Roosevelt do? Stop being on the sidelines. He decided to speak out, and he went on a speaking tour out west where he was always the most popular, and he gave a speech in particular in Osawatomie, Kansas, where he introduced a concept called the New Nationalism. Now, this was progressivism on steroids, doubling down on his previous administration's ideas, a square deal for all, bringing Roosevelt's morality issues into national policy. And he gave a hundred addresses along these lines. The crowds love it. And by the way, the President William Taft was barely mentioned in any of these speeches, and Taft noticed. Taft said to his brother Charlie, I am bound to say that his speeches are fuller of the ego now than they ever were, and he allows himself to fall into a style that makes one think he considers himself still the President of the United States. In most of these speeches, he has utterly ignored me. Taft was hurt. He was confused. Things were getting worse as Roosevelt would continue to speak out, grow more distant, more aggressive on his own, leaving Taft in a funk. Somehow people have convinced the Colonel Roosevelt that I have gone back on him and he does not seem to be able to get that out of his mind. But it distresses me very deeply, more deeply than anyone can know the thoughts and sentiments of the President of the United States as that Rooseveltian cloud continue to hang over everything to do with his presidency. A couple of other things happening that also difficult for Taft in 1910 during the summer. The Chief Justice of the United States, Mel Filler, died. What did that mean? Well, Taft had to appoint someone, and this was a sad moment for him because this is the job he always wanted, Chief Justice of the United States. He's stuck being president. That's not the job he wanted. One has to wonder, did he even consider nominating himself? And if he was confirmed, stepping down for the presidency to take the job he really wanted? Well, 
There's no indication that he did. He did not take such action. Interesting move, though. He elevated an associate justice, Edward White, who was a Southern Democrat who had fought for the Confederacy to be the new chief justice. This further angered the Republicans and many of the progressives. The other thing then, politics kicked in. Midterm elections was a disaster for the Republicans. They lost the House to the Democrats for the first time since 1894. They lost seats in the Senate. They still held the majority. But if the progressives in the Republican caucus sided with the Democrats, which in some cases they did, then they would have a majority against Taft's conservatives in the Senate as well. Things were not going well. Two very rough years in the presidency, very few wins, many setbacks. And really the biggest thing is he was not meeting expectations. He was not Theodore Roosevelt. He was personally anguished and things were about to get worse. That is the story for another day. That is William Taft. He's not TR from the life of William Taft. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles.